Chapter Three of the Invasion by William LeCue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Three: Great British Victory. The following dispatch from the war correspondent of the Times with Lord Byfield was received on the morning of October five, but was not published in that journal till some days later owing to the German censorship which necessitated its being kept secret. Will is then, October 4, evening. After a bloody but successful combat lasting from early dawn till late in the afternoon, the country to the immediate west of the metropolis had been swept clear of the hated invaders, and the masses of the League of Defenders can be poured into the west of London without let or hindrance. In the desperate street-fighting which is now going on, they will be much more formidable than they were ever likely to be in the open field where they were absolutely incapable of manoeuvring. As for the Saxons, what is left of them, and Froelich's cavalry division, with whom we have been engaged all day, they have now fallen back on Harrow and Hendon, it is said. But it is currently reported that a constant movement towards the high ground near Hampstead is going on. These rumours come by way of London, since the enemy's enormous force of cavalry is still strong enough to prevent us getting any first-hand intelligence of his movements. As has been previously reported, the Twelfth Saxon Corps, under the command of Prince Henry of Württemberg, had taken up a position intended to cover the metropolis from the hordes of defenders which, supported by a small leaven of regulars, with a proportion of cavalry and guns, were known to be slowly rolling up from the west and south. Their front, facing west, extended from Staines on the south to Pinner on the north, passing through Stanwell, West Drayton, and Uxbridge. In addition they had a strong reserve in the neighbourhood of Hounslow, whose business it was to cover their left flank by keeping watch along the line of the Thames. They had destroyed all bridges over the river between Staines and Hammersmith. Hutney Bridge, however, was still intact, as all attacks on it had been repulsed by the British holding it on the south side. Such was the general state of affairs when Lord Byfield, who had established his headquarters at Windsor, formed his plan of attack. As far as I have been able to ascertain, its general idea was to hold the Saxons to the position by the threat of three hundred thousand defenders that were assembled and were continually increasing along a roughly parallel line to that occupied by the enemy at about ten miles at distance from it, while he attacked their left flank with what regular and militia regiments he could rapidly get together, near Esher and Kingston. By this time the southern lines in the neighbourhood of London were all in working order. The damage that had been done here and there by small parties of the enemy who had made raids across the river having been repaired. It was, therefore, not a very difficult matter to assemble troops from Windsor and various points on the south of London at very short notice. General Bamford, to whom had been entrusted the defence of South London, and who had established his headquarters at the Crystal Palace, also contributed every man he could spare from the remnant of the regular troops under his command. It was considered quite safe now that the Germans in the city were so hardly pressed to leave the defence of the Thames Bridge to the masses of irregulars who had all along formed the bulk of their defenders. The risk that Prince Henry of Württemberg would take the bull by the horns, and by a sudden forward move attack and scatter the inert and invertebrate mass of defenders who were in his immediate front had, of course, to be taken. But it was considered that, in the present state of affairs in London, he would hardly dare to increase the distance between the Saxon corps and the rest of the German army. Events proved the correctness of this surmise, but, owing to unforeseen circumstances, the course of the battle was somewhat different from that which had been anticipated. Despite the vigilance of the German spies, our plans were kept secret till the very end, and it is believed that the great convergence of regular troops that began as soon as it was dark from Windsor and from along the line occupied by the Army of the League on the west, right round to Greenwich on the east, went on without any news of the movement being carried to the enemy. Before dawn this morning every unit was in the position to which it had been previously detailed, and everything was in readiness, the Royal Engineers began to throw a pontoon bridge over the Thames at the point where it makes a bend to the south, 
just above the site of Walton Bridge. The enemy's patrols and pickets in the immediate neighborhood at once opened a heavy fire on the workers, but it was beaten down by that which was poured upon them from the houses in Walton-on-Thames which had been quietly occupied during the night. The enemy in vain tried to reinforce them, but in order to do this their troops had to advance into a narrow peninsula which was swept by a cross-fire of shells from batteries which had been placed in position on the south side of the river for this very purpose. By seven o'clock the bridge was completed, and the troops were beginning to cross over covered by the fire of the artillery and by an advance guard which had been pushed over in boats. Simultaneously very much the same thing had been going on at Long Ditton, and fierce fighting was going on in the avenues and gardens round Hampton Court. Success here, too, attended the British arms. As a matter of fact, a determined attempt to cross the river in force had not at all been anticipated by the Germans. They had not credited their opponents with the power of so rapidly assembling an army and assuming an effective and vigorous offensive so soon after their terrible series of disasters. What they had probably looked for was an attempt to overwhelm them by sheer force of numbers. They doubtless calculated that Lord Byfield would stiffen his flabby masses of defenders with what trained troops he could muster, and endeavor to attack their lines along their whole length, overlapping them on the flank. They realized that to do this he would have to sacrifice his men in thousands upon thousands, but they knew that to do so would be his only possible chance of success in this eventuality since the bulk of his men could neither maneuver nor deploy. Still they reckoned that in the desperate situation of the British he would make up his mind to do this. On their part, although they fully realized the possibility of being overwhelmed by such tactics, they felt pretty confident that, posted as they were behind a perfect network of small rivers and streams which ran down to join the Thames, they would at least succeed in beating off the attack with heavy loss and stood no bad chance of turning the repulse into a rout by skilful use of Furlick's cavalry division, which would be irresistible when attacking totally untrained troops after they had been shattered and disorganized by artillery fire. This, at least, is the view of those experts with whom I have spoken. What perhaps tended rather to confirm them in their theories as to the action of the British was the rifle-firing that went on along the whole of their front all night through. The officers in charge of the various units which conglomerated together formed the forces facing the Saxons, had picked out the few men under their command who really had some little idea of using a rifle, and, supplied with plenty of ammunition, had sent them forward in numerous small parties with general orders to approach as near the enemy's picket line as possible, and as soon as fired on, to lie down and open fire in return. So a species of sniping engagement went on from dark to dawn. Several parties got captured or cut up by the German outlying troops, and many others got shot by neighboring parties of snipers. But although they did not in all probability do the enemy much damage, yet they kept them on the alert all night and led them to expect an attack in the morning. One way and another luck was entirely on the side of the patriots that morning. When daylight came, the British massed to the westward of Staines and had such a threatening appearance from their intense numbers, and their fire from the batteries of heavy guns and howitzers on the south side of the river, which took the German left flank in, was so heavy that Prince Henry, who was there in person, judged an attack to be imminent, and would not spare a man to reinforce his troops at Shepperton and Halliford, who were numerically totally inadequate to resist the advance of the British once they got across the river. He turned a deaf ear to the most imploring requests for assistance, but ordered the officer in command at Hounslow to move down at once and drive the British into the river. So it has been reported by our prisoners. Unluckily for him, this officer had his hands quite full enough at this time, for the British who had crossed at Long Ditton had now made themselves masters of everything east of the Thames Valley branch of the London and South Western Railway, were being continually reinforced and were fast pushing their right along the western bank of the river. Their left was reported to be in Kempton Park, where they joined hands with those who had effected a crossing near Walton-on-Thames. More bridges were being built at Platts-Iot, 
Tags Eyot, and Sunbury Lock, while boats and wherries and shoals appeared from all creeks and backwaters and hiding places as soon as both banks were in the hands of the British. Regulars, militia, and lastly volunteers were now pouring across in thousands. Forward was still the word. About noon a strong force of Saxons was reported to be retreating along the road from Staines to Brentford. They had guns with them which engaged the field batteries which were at once pushed forward by the British to attack them. These troops, eventually joining hands with those at Hounslow, opposed a more determined resistance to our advance than we had hitherto encountered. According to what we learned subsequently from prisoners and others, they were commanded by Prince Henry of Württemberg in person. He had quitted his position at Staines, leaving only a single battalion and a few guns as a rear guard to oppose the masses of the defenders who threatened him in that direction, and had placed his troops in the best position he could to cover the retreat of the rest of his corps from the line they had been occupying. He had, it would appear, soon after the fighting began, received the most urgent orders from von Kronhelm to fall back on London and assist him in the street fighting that had now been going on without intermission for the best part of two days. Von Kronhelm probably thought that he would be able to draw off some of his numerous foes to the westward, but the message was received too late. Prince Henry did his best to obey it, but by this time the very existence of the Twelfth Corps was at stake on account of the totally unexpected attack on his left rear by the British regular troops. He opposed such a stout resistance with the troops under his immediate command that he brought the British advance to a temporary standstill, while in his rear every road leading Londonward was crowded with the rest of his army as they fell back from West Drayton, Uxbridge, Ryslip, and Pinner. Had they been facing trained soldiers they would have found it most difficult, if not impossible, to do this but as it was the undisciplined and untrained masses of the League of Defenders lost a long time in advancing and still longer in getting over a series of streams and dikes that lay between them and the abandoned Saxon position. They lost heavily, too, from the fire of the small rear guards that had been left at the most likely crossing places. The Saxons were therefore able to get quite well away from them, and when some attempt was being made to form up the thousands of men who presently found themselves congregated on the heath east of Uxbridge before advancing further, a whole brigade of Frulich's heavy cavalry suddenly swept down upon them from behind Ickham village. The debacle that followed was frightful. The unwieldy mass of leaguers swayed this way and that for a moment in the panic occasioned by the sudden apparition of the serried masses of charging cavalry that were rushing down on them with a thunder of hooves that shook the earth. A few scattered shots were fired, without any perceptible effect, and before they could either form up or fly the German riders were upon them. It was a perfect massacre. The leaguers could oppose no resistance whatever. They were ridden down and slaughtered with no more difficulty than if they had been a flock of sheep. Swinging their long straight swords, the cavalrymen cut them down at hundreds and drove thousands into the river. The defenders were absolutely pulverized and fled westwards in a huge scattered crowd. But if the Germans had the satisfaction of scoring a local victory in this quarter, things were by no means rosy for them elsewhere. Prince Henry, by desperate efforts, contrived to hold on long enough in his covering position to enable the Saxons from the central portion of his abandoned line to pass through Hounslow and move along the London road through Brentford. Here disaster befell them. A battery of 4.7 guns was suddenly unmasked on Richmond Hill, and, firing at a range of 5,000 yards, played havoc with the marching column. The head of it also suffered severe loss from riflemen concealed in Kew Gardens, and the whole force had to extend and fall back for some distance in a northerly direction. Near Ealing they met the Uxbridge Brigade, and a certain delay and confusion occurred. However, trained soldiers such as these are not difficult to reorganize, and while the latter continued its march along the main road, the remainder moved in several small parallel columns through Acton and Turnham Green. Before another half-hour had elapsed, there came a sound of firing from the advance guard. Orders to halt followed, then orders to send forward reinforcements. During all this time 
the rattle of rifle fire waxed heavier and heavier it soon became apparent that every road and street leading into london was barricaded and that the houses on either side were crammed with riflemen before any set plan of action could be determined on the retiring saxons found themselves committed to a very nasty bout of street fighting their guns were almost useless since they could not be placed in positions from which they could fire on the barricades except so close as to be under effective rifle fire they made several desperate attempts most of which were repulsed in goldhawk road a jaeger battalion contrived to rush a big rampart of paving stones which had been improvised by the british but once over they were decimated by the fire from the houses on either side of the street big high explosive shells from richmond hill too began to drop among the saxons though the range was long the gunners were evidently well informed of the whereabouts of the saxon troops and made wonderfully lucky shooting for some time the distant rumble of the firing to the southwest had been growing more distinct in their ears and about four o'clock it suddenly broke out comparatively nearby then came an order from prince henry to fall back on ealing at once what had happened it will not take long to relate this prince henry's covering position had lain roughly between east benfont and hounslow facing southeast he had contrived to hold on to the latter place long enough to allow his right to pivot on it and fall back to cranford bridge here they were to a certain extent relieved from the close pressure they had been subjected to by the constantly advancing british troops by the able and determined action of furlick's cavalry brigade but in the meantime his enemies on the left constantly reinforced from across the river while never desisting from their so far unsuccessful attack on hounslow worked round through twickenham and islesworth till they began to menace his rear he must abandon hounslow or be cut off with consummate generalship he withdrew his left along the line of the metropolitan and district railway and sent word to the troops on his right to retire and take up a second position at southall green unluckily for him there was a delay in transmission resulting in a considerable number of these troops being cut off and captured frulich's cavalry were unable to aid them at this juncture having their attention drawn away by the masses of leaguers who had managed to get over the column and were congregating near harmonsworth they cut these up and dispersed them but afterwards found that they were separated from the saxons by a strong force of british regular troops who occupied harlington and opened a fire on the riders that emptied numerous saddles they therefore made off to the northward from this forward nothing could check the steady advance of the english though fierce fighting went on till dark all through hanwell ealing perivale and wembley the saxons struggling gamely to the last but getting more and more disorganized had it not been for frolic's division on their right they would have been surrounded as it was they must have lost half their strength in casualties and prisoners at dark however lord byfield ordered a general halt of his tired though triumphant troops and bivouacked and billeted them along a line reaching from willesden on the right through wembley to greenford he had established his headquarters at wembley i have heard some critics say that he ought to have pushed on his freshest troops toward hendon to prevent the remnants of our opponents from re-entering london but others with reason urge that he is right to let them into the metropolis which they will now find to be merely a trap extracts from the diary of general von kleppen commander of the fourth german army corps occupying london dorchester house park lane october sixth we are completely deceived our position much as we are attempting to conceal it is a very grave one we believe that if we reached london the british spirit would be broken yet the more drastic our rule the fiercer becomes the opposition how it will end i fear to contemplate the British are dull and apathetic, but, once roused, they fight like fiends. Last night we had an example of it. This League of Defenders, which von Kronhelm has always treated with ridicule, is, we have discovered, too late, practically the whole of England. Von Bistrom, commanding the Seventh Corps, and von Haeslin, of the Eighth Corps, 
have constantly been reporting its spread through Manchester, Leeds, Bradford, Sheffield, Birmingham, and the other great towns we now occupy. But our commander-in-chief has treated the matter lightly, declaring it to be a kind of offshoot of some organization they have in England, called the Primrose League. Yesterday, at the Council of War, however, he was compelled to acknowledge his error when I handed him a scarlet handbill calling upon the British to make a concerted attack upon us at ten o'clock. Fortunately, we were prepared for the assault, otherwise I verily believe that the honors would have rested upon the populace in London. As it is, we suffered considerable reverses in various districts, where our men were lured into the narrow side streets and cut up. I confess I am greatly surprised at the valiant stand made everywhere by the Londoners. Last night they fought to the very end. A disaster to our arms in the Strand was followed by a victory in Trafalgar Square, where von Vilberg had established defences for the purpose of preventing the joining of the people of the East End with those of the West. End of chapter 3 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 4 of The Invasion by William Le Q. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter 4 Massacre of Germans in London. Daily Telegraph Office, October 12, 6 p.m. Through the whole of last week the Germans occupying London suffered great losses. They are now hemmed in on every side. At three o'clock this morning, von Kronhelm, having withdrawn the greater part of the troops from the defense of the bridges, in an attempt to occupy defensive positions in North London, the South Londoners, impatient with long waiting, broke forth and came across the river in enormous multitudes, every man bent upon killing a German wherever seen. The night air was rent everywhere by the hoarse exultant shouts as London, the giant all-powerful city, fell upon the audacious invader. Through our office windows came the dull roar of London's millions swelled by the defenders from the west and south of England and by the gallant men from Canada, India, the Cape, and other British colonies who had come forward to fight for the mother country as soon as her position was known to be critical. In the streets are to be seen colonial uniforms side by side with a costermonger from Whitechapel or Walworth, and dark-faced Indians in turbans are fighting out in Fleet Street and the Strand. In the great struggle now taking place, many of our reporters and correspondents have unfortunately been wounded, and alas, four of them killed. In these terrible days a man's life is not safe from one moment to another both sides seem to have now lost their heads completely. Among the Germans all semblance of order has apparently been thrown to the winds. It is known that London has risen to a man, and the enemy are therefore fully aware of their imminent peril. Already they are beaten. True, von Kronhelm still sits in the war office directing operations, operations he knows too well are foredoomed to failure. The Germans have, it must be admitted, carried on the war in a chivalrous spirit until those drastic executions exasperated the people. Then neither side gave quarter, and now today, all through Islington, Hoxton, Kingsland, and Dalston, right out eastwards to Homerton, a perfect massacre of Germans is in progress. Lord Byfield has issued two urgent proclamations, threatening the people of London with all sorts of penalties if they kill instead of taking an enemy prisoner, but they seem to have no effect. London is starved and angered to such a pitch that her hatred knows no bounds, and only blood will atone for the wholesale slaughter of the innocent since the bombardment of the metropolis began. The Kaiser has, we hear, left the Belvedere at Scarborough, where he has been living incognito. A confidential report, apparently well-founded, has reached us that he embarked upon the steam trawler Morning Star at Scarborough yesterday and set out across the Dogger with Germany, of course, as his destination. 
surely he must now regret his ill-advised policy of making an attack upon England. He had gauged our military weakness very accurately, but he had not counted upon the patriotic spirit of our empire. It may be that he has already given orders to von Kronhelm, but it is nevertheless a very significant fact that the German wireless telegraph apparatus on the summit of Big Ben is in constant use by the German commander-in-chief. He is probably in hourly communication with Bremen or with the Emperor himself upon the trawler Morning Star. Near Highbury Fields about noon today some British cavalry surprised a party of Germans and attempted to take them prisoners. The latter showed fight, whereupon they were shot down to a man. The British held as prisoners by the Germans near Enfield have now been released and are rejoining their comrades along the northern heights. Many believe that another and final battle will be fought north of London, but military men declare that the German power is already broken. Whether von Kronhelm will still continue to lose his men at the rate he is now doing, or whether he will sue for peace, is an open question. Personally he was against the bombardment of London from the very first, yet he was compelled to carry out the orders of his imperial master. The invasion, the landing, and the successes in the north were, in his opinion, quite sufficient to have paralyzed British trade and caused such panic that an indemnity would have been paid. To attack London was, in his opinion, a proceeding far too dangerous, and his estimate is now proved to have been the correct one. Now that they have lost command of the sea and are cut off from their bases in Essex, the enemy's situation is hopeless. They may struggle on, but assuredly the end can only be an ignominious one. Yet the German eagle still flies proudly over the war office, over St. Stephen's, and upon many other public buildings, while upon others British royal standards and Union jacks are commencing to appear, each one being cheered by the excited Londoners, whose hearts are now full of hope. Germany shall be made to bite the dust. That is the war cry everywhere. Many a proud Uhlan and Cruzier has to-day ridden to his death amid the dense mobs, mad with the lust of blood. Some of the more unfortunate of the enemy have been lynched and torn limb from limb, while others have died deaths too horrible to hear describe in detail. Each hour brings to us further news showing how, by slow degrees, the German army of occupation is being wiped out. People are jeering at the audacious claim for indemnity presented to the British government when the enemy entered London and are asking whether we will not present a claim to Germany. Von Kronhelm is not blamed so much as his emperor. He has been the cat's paw and has burned his fingers in endeavoring to snatch the chestnuts from the fire. As a commander he has acted justly, fully observing the international laws concerning war. It was only when faced by the problem of a national uprising that he countenanced anything bordering upon capital punishment. An hour ago our censors were withdrawn. They came and shook hands with many members of the staff and retired. This surely is a significant fact that von Kromhelm hopes to regain the confidence of London by appearing to treat her with a fatherly solicitude. Or is it that he intends to sue for peace at any price? An hour ago another desperate attempt was made on the part of the men of South London, aided by a large body of British regulars, to regain possession of the war office. Whitehall was once more the scene of a bloody fight, but so strongly does von Kronhelm hold the place and all the adjacent thoroughfares, he apparently regarding it as his own fortress, that the attack was repulsed with heavy loss on our side. All the bridges are now open. The barricades are in most cases being blown up, and people are passing and repassing freely for the first time since the day following the memorable bombardment. London streets, however, in a most deplorable condition. On every hand is ruin and devastation. Whole streets of houses rendered gaunt and windowless by the now-spent fires meet the eye everywhere. In certain places the ruins were still smoldering and in one or two districts the conflagration spread over an enormous area. Even if peace be declared, can London ever recover from this present wreck? Paris recovered, and quickly too. 
Therefore we place our faith in British wealth, British industry, and British patriotism. Yes, the tide has turned. The great revenge now in progress is truly a mad and bloody one. In Kilburn this afternoon there was a wholesale killing of a company of German infantry who, while marching along the high road, were set upon by the armed mob and practically exterminated. The smaller thoroughfares, Brondesbury Road, Victoria Road, Glendall Road, and Priory Park Road across the Paddington Cemetery were the scene of a frightful slaughter. The Germans died hard, but in the end were completely wiped out. German baiting is now indeed the Londoner's pastime, and on this dark and rainy afternoon hundreds of men of the fatherland have died upon the wet roads. Sitting here in a newspaper office as we do, and having fresh reports constantly before us, we are able to review the whole situation impartially. Every moment, through the various news agencies and our own correspondents and contributors, we are receiving fresh facts, facts which all combine to show that von Kronhelm cannot hold out much longer. Surely the commander-in-chief of a civilized army will not allow his men to be massacred as they are now being. The enemy's troops, mixed up in the maze of London streets as they are, are utterly unable to cope with the oncoming multitudes, some armed with rifles and others with anything they can lay their hands upon. Women, wild, infuriated women, have now made their reappearance north of the Thames. In more than one instance where German soldiers have attempted to take refuge in houses, these women have obtained petrol and, with screams of fiendish delight, set the houses in question on fire. Awful dramas are being enacted in every part of the metropolis. The history of today is written in German blood. Lord Byfield has established temporary headquarters at Jack Straw's Castle, where von Kronhelm was during the bombardment, and last night we could see the signals exchanged between Hampstead and Sydenham Hill, from whence General Bamford has not yet moved. Our cavalry in Essex are, it is said, doing excellent work. Lord Byfield has also sent a body of troops across from Gravesend to Tilbury, and these have regained Malden and Southminster after some hard fighting. Advices from Gravesend state that further reinforcements are being sent across the river to operate against the east of London and hem in the Germans on that side. So confident is London of success that several of the railways are commencing to reorganize their traffic. A train left Willesden this afternoon for Birmingham, the first since the bombardment, while another has left Finsbury Park for Peterborough to continue to York if possible. So wrecked are the London termini, however, that it must be some weeks before trains can arrive or be dispatched from either Euston, King's Cross, Paddington, Marylebone, or St. Pancras. In many cases the line just north of the terminus is interrupted by a blown-up tunnel or a fallen bridge, therefore the termination of traffic must, for the present, be at some distance north on the outskirts of London. Shops are also opening in South London, though they have but little to sell. Nevertheless, this may be regarded as a sign of renewed confidence. Besides, supplies of provisions are now arriving, and the London County Council and the Salvation Army are distributing free soup and food in the lower-class districts. Private charity, everywhere abundant during the trying days of dark despair, is doing inestimable good among every class. The hard, grasping employer and the smug financier, who had hitherto kept scrupulous accounts, and have been noteworthy on account of their uncharitableness, have now, in the hour of need, come forward and subscribed liberally to the great Mansion House Fund, opened yesterday by the Deputy Lord Mayor of London. The subscription list occupies six columns of the issue of tomorrow's paper, and this in itself speaks well for the open-heartedness of the money classes of Great Britain. No movement has yet been made in the financial world bankers still remain with closed doors. The bullion seized at Southminster and other places is now under strong British guard, and will, it is supposed, be returned to the bank immediately. Only a comparatively small sum has yet been sent across to Germany. Therefore all von Kronhelm's strategy has utterly failed. By the invasion Germany has, up to the present moment, gained nothing. 
she has made huge demands at which we can afford to jeer. True, she has wrecked London, but have we not sent the greater part of her fleet to the bottom of the North Sea, and have we not created havoc in German ports? The leave-taking of our two gold spectacle censors was almost pathetic. We had come to regard them as necessities to puzzle and to play practical jokes of language upon. Today, for the first time, we have received none of those official notices in German with English translations which of late have appeared so prominently in our columns. The German eagle is gradually disentangling his talons from London and means to escape us, if he can. 10.30 p.m. Private information has just reached us from a most reliable source that a conference has been arranged between von Kronhelm and Lord Byfield. This evening the German field marshal sent a messenger to the British headquarters at Hampstead under a flag of truce. He bore a dispatch from the German commander asking that hostilities should be suspended for twenty-four hours and that they should make an appointment for a meeting during that period. Von Kronhelm has left the time and place of meeting to Lord Byfield and has informed the British commander that he has sent telegraphic instruction to the German military commanders of Birmingham, Sheffield, Manchester, Bradford, Leeds, Northampton, Stafford, Oldham, Wigan, Bolton, and other places, giving notice of his suggestion to the British and ordering that for the present hostilities on the part of the Germans shall be suspended. It seems more than likely that the German field marshal has received these very definite instructions by wireless telegraph from the Emperor at Bremen or Potsdam. We understand that Lord Byfield, after a brief consultation by telegraph with the government at Bristol, has sent a reply. Of its nature, however, nothing is known, and at the moment of writing hostilities are still in progress. In an hour's time we shall probably know whether the war is to continue or a truce is to be proclaimed. Midnight. Lord Byfield has granted a truce, and hostilities have now been suspended. London has gone mad with delight, for the German yoke is cast off. Further information, which has just reached us from private sources, states that thousands of prisoners have been taken by Lord Byfield today, and that von Kronhelm has acknowledged his position to be absolutely hopeless. The German army has been defeated by our British patriots who have fought so valiantly and so well. It is not likely that the war will be resumed. Von Kronhelm received a number of British officers at the war office half an hour ago, and it is said that he is already making preparations to vacate the post he has usurped. Lord Byfield has issued a reassuring message to London, which we have just received with instructions to print. It declares that although for the moment only a truce is proclaimed, yet this means the absolute cessation of all hostilities. The naval news of the past few days may be briefly summarized. The British main fleet entered the North Sea, and our submarines did most excellent work in the neighborhood of the mass lightship. Prince Stahlberger had concentrated practically the whole of his naval force off Lowestoft, but a desperate battle was fought about seventy miles from the Texel, full details of which are not yet to hand. All that is known is that, having now regained command of the sea, we were enabled to inflict a crushing defeat upon the Germans, in which the German flagship was sunk. In the end, sixty-one British ships were concentrated against seventeen German, with the result that the German fleet has practically been wiped out, there being nineteen thousand of the enemy's officers and men on the casualty list, the greatest recorded in any naval battle. Whatever may be the demands for indemnity on either side, one thing is absolutely certain, namely, that the invincible German army and navy are completely vanquished. The eagle's wings are trailing in the dust. End of chapter 4. Recording by Tom Weiss. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Chapter 5 of The Invasion by William Lequeux. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter 5 How the War Ended. 
Days passed. Weary, waiting, anxious days. A whole month went by. What had really happened at sea was unknown. After the truce, London very gradually began to resume her normal life, though the gaunt state of the streets was indescribably weird. Shops began to open, and as each day passed, food became more plentiful and consequently less dear. The truce meant the end of the war, therefore thanksgiving services were held in every town and village throughout the country. There were great prison camps of Germans at Hounslow, Brentwood, and Barnett, while von Kronhelm and his chief officers were also held as prisoners until some decision through diplomatic channels could be arrived at. Meanwhile, a little business began to be done. Thousands began to resume their employment, bankers reopened their doors, and within a week the distress and suffering of the poor became perceptibly alleviated. The task of burying the dead after the terrible massacre of the Germans in the London streets had been a stupendous one, but so quickly had it been accomplished that an epidemic was happily averted. Parliament moved back to Westminster, and daily meetings of the Cabinet were being held in Downing Street. These resulted in the resignation of the Ministry, and with a fresh Cabinet, in which Mr. Gerald Graham, the organizer of the Defenders, was given a seat, a settlement was at last arrived at. To further describe the chaotic state of England occasioned by the terrible and bloody war would serve no purpose. The loss and suffering which it had caused the country had been incalculable. Statisticians estimated that in one month of hostilities it had amounted to five hundred million pounds, a part of which represented money transferred from British pockets to German, as the enemy had carried off some of the securities upon which the German troops had laid their hands in London. Let us for a moment take a retrospective glance. Consuls were at fifty, bread was still at one shilling sixpence per loaf, and the ravages of the German commerce destroyers had sent up the cost of insurance on British shipping sky high. Money was almost unprocurable, except for the manufacture of war material there was no industry, and the suffering and distress among the poor could not be exaggerated. In all directions men, women, and children had been starving. The mercantile community were loud in their outcry for peace at any price, and the pro-German and Stop the War Party were equally vehement in demanding a cessation of the war. They found excuses for the enemy, and forgot the frightful devastation and loss which the invasion had caused to the country. They insisted that the working class gained nothing, even though the British fleet was closely blockading the German coast and their outcry was strengthened when a few days after the blockade of the Elbe had begun, two British battleships were so unfortunate as to strike German mines and sink with a large part of their crews. The difficulty of borrowing money for the prosecution of the war was a grave obstacle in the way of the party of action, and preyed upon the mind of the British government. Socialism, with its creed of, Thou shalt have no other god but thyself, and its doctrine, let us eat and drink, for to-morrow we die, had replaced the religious beliefs of a generation of Englishmen taught to suffer and to die sooner than surrender to wrong. In the hour of trial, amidst smoking ruins, among the holocausts of dead which marked the prolonged, bloody, and terrible battles on land and at sea, the spirit of the nation quailed, and there was really no great leader to recall it to ways of honor and duty. The wholesale destruction of food, and particularly of wheat and meat, removed from the world's market a large part of its supplies, and had immediately sent up the cost of food everywhere, outside the United Kingdom as well as in it. At the same time the attacks upon shipping laden with food increased the cost of insurance to prohibitive prices upon vessels freighted for the United Kingdom. The underwriters after the first few captures by the enemy would not insure at all except for fabulous rates. The withdrawal of all the larger British cruisers for the purpose of defeating the main German fleets in the North Sea left the commerce destroyers a free hand, and there was no force to meet them. The British liners commissioned as commerce protectors were too few and too slow to be able to hold their adversaries in check. Neutral shipping was molested by the German cruisers. 
whenever raw cotton or food of any kind was discovered upon a neutral vessel bound for British ports, the vessel was seized and sent into one or other of the German harbors on the west coast of Africa. The United Kingdom, indeed, might have been reduced to absolute starvation had it not been for the fact that the Canadian government interfered in Canada to prevent similar German tactics from succeeding and held the German contracts for the cornering of Canadian wheat, contrary to public policy. The want of food, the high price of bread and meat in England, and the greatly increased cost of the supplies of raw materials sent up the expenditure upon poor relief to enormous figures. Millions of men were out of employment and in need of assistance. Mills and factories in all directions had closed down, either because of the military danger from the operations of the German armies, or because of the want of orders, or again because raw materials were not procurable. Unfortunately, when the invasion began, many rich foreigners who had lived in England collected what portable property they possessed, and retired abroad to Switzerland, Italy, and the United States. Their example was followed by large numbers of British subjects who had invested abroad, and now, in the hour of distress, were able to place their securities in a handbag and withdraw them to happier countries. They may justly be blamed for this one of patriotism, but their reply was that they had been unjustly and mercilessly taxed by men who derided patriotism, misused power, and neglected the real interest of the nation in the desire to pander to the mob. Moreover, with the income tax at three shillings sixpence in the pound, and with the cost of living enormously enhanced, they declared that it was a positive impossibility to live in England, while into the bargain their lives were exposed to danger from the enemy. As a result of this wholesale emigration, in London and the country the number of empty houses inordinately increased, and there were few well-to-do people left to pay the rates and taxes. The fearful burden of the extravagant debts which the British municipalities had heaped up was cruelly felt, since the nation had to repudiate the responsibility which it had incurred for the payment of interest on the local debts. The socialist dream, in fact, might also be said to have been realized. There were few rich left, but the consequences to the poor, instead of being beneficial, were utterly disastrous. Under the pressure of public opinion, constrained by hunger and financial necessities, and with thousands of German prisoners in their hands, the British government acceded to the suggested conference to secure peace. Peace was finally signed on January 13, 1911. The British Empire emerged from the conflict outwardly intact, but internally so weakened that only the most resolute reforms accomplished by the ablest and boldest statesmen could have restored it to its old position. Germany, on the other hand, emerged with an additional 21,000 miles of European territory, with an extended seaboard on the North Sea fronting the United Kingdom at Rotterdam and the Texel, and, it was calculated, with a slight pecuniary advantage. Practically the entire cost of the war had been borne by England. As is always the case, the poor suffered most. The socialists who had declared against armaments were faithless friends of those whom they professed to champion. Their dream of a golden age proved utterly delusive. But the true authors of England's misfortunes escaped blame for the moment, and the army and navy were made the scapegoats of the great catastrophe. When success did come, it came too late and could not be utilized without a great British army capable of carrying the war into the enemy's country and thus compelling a satisfactory peace. This is the end of the invasion by William LeCue. Recording by Tom Weiss. Tom's Audiobooks dot com. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks.